<laughs> Son of a bitch. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> oh, man. Talk about a throwback show. Oh. <laughs> From ScienceSortOf.com, you're listening to Science Sort Of. Hello and welcome to Science Sort Of. This is episode 256. It's our annual, semi-annual, no, it's annual, Thanksgiving episode. Hooray. Theme, as always, is giving thanks. This time it's giving thanks six. You're welcome. Uh, I'm your host, Ryan, and joining me to talk about things that are science, things that are sort of science, and things that wish they were science is Charlie. Hey, everybody. And Patrick. Gobble, gobble, gobble. Because who else would you want for for the Thanksgiving episode? So uh, in our Thanksgiving episodes, we like to do all listener feedback episodes. Ben's, Ben's pretty good. Yeah, Ben's well. Ben has contributions coming up down the yeah. down the pike. Canadian Thanksgiving was a long That's time true. ago. He's here in spirit. That's true. Also, we missed that Canadian Thanksgiving by like a month. So I have an email from Bettina, who is currently a master student at Utrecht University in the Netherlands, studying environmental biology, but is actually an American. Um, She points out to us that even though we all love German and Belgian beer, to be honest, the variety of beer offered here kind of sucks compared to the craft beer scene I was used to in the US. I think Europe is finally catching on. Uh, Ryan, have you heard of the small Belgian brewery Distrus? It's one of the coolest small Belgian craft breweries around. Anyway, that's all beside the point. This email has a few other points. It's not beside the point because I agree with her because I've been to Europe a couple of times since getting into craft beer. And I think the American scene easily surpasses it and that they are only starting to catch up to, to the, the hotness we've been laying down. So I agree with her. Um, as to that particular brewery, yes, I've had one of their beers before, uh, an old monk's ale. And it was super figgy and like fruity and delicious. And I liked it. So... Kudos to that. Um, She wants to let us know that she finally left an iTunes review, which is great. We usually save it for the end of the show. So for people who don't normally listen all the way through to the end, uh, iTunes reviews are a really big help for us getting noticed by people who are looking for new science podcasts. So iTunes reviews are really great and we appreciate it. Uh, She says, you guys are the kind of people that make me love being a scientist. By the way, I have decided, uh, she says she's going to start a recurring donation once she, get a real, once she gets a real job after grad school. I understand. <laughs> and now she has a question slash suggested topic. Uh, she just listened to the episode Mescales y Moas, which got me excited for a number of reasons. For one thing, my husband and I will be traveling to New Zealand in January, so hearing about it was a lot of fun. For another thing, I did a lot of my undergrad work on archaeology and I've always been interested in historical human-wildlife interactions. Hmm. Uh, So the MOA story was very cool. Finally, this reminded me of a topic I'm currently writing about for school and I thought I'd share it with you all and get your input. Have you heard of rewilding? I think it is one uh, more of a thing in Europe than in the US, but it exists in both. Essentially, it involves taking animals that once existed in certain habitats and either reintroducing those animals or trying to find a current species that acts similarly and introducing those instead. I first heard about it from an organization that has been working to reintroduce the European bison, which was extinct in the wild, back onto abandoned farmland that they've bought around Europe. My first reaction was to this was, what? Whenever humans introduce a new species, things go wrong, which led me to research it more, and now I'm doing a short writing project about it. The interesting thing is that digging in deeper, there's a wide range of opinions out there about rewilding and its role in conservation. It turns out that this organization is fairly cautious, taking it one step at a time. The main issue I have with them is that they aren't currently doing any scientific monitoring, although they have no problem allowing scientists access to come do the research. Other people out there have much more radical ideas about the possibilities of rewilding, which I think has given it a bad reputation amongst scientists. I'm personally rather torn on the issue, so I just wondered what you all thought about it. Uh... And then uh, she gives us a few references that we can link to in the show notes. But uh, with that, I'll, I'll toss it to you guys. What do you guys think about rewilding? Yeah, it's hard. It's, it's hard to know. Like she says, usually we people tend to screw things up. But, you know, whatever. Things are so screwed up now. I don't know that it matters that much. And also, it, it seems like we mostly on a re- only want to rewild megafauna, which I guess is a largely what's disappeared yeah, the late Pleistocene extinction did seem to target megafauna uh, more so than than small species. The some you know, let's put back the passenger pigeon or the Carolina parakeet. I, I mean, I think 
I would have less of a problem with that than I do with some of the megafauna. Or even, yeah, yeah like repopulation fungal, fungal colonies in different soils to help like the ecosystem from the dirt up, literally. I mean, I feel like we know so little about the proper balance for fungal ecosystems in general. I don't know how we'd even begin to, to figure out how to do that properly. We need scientists. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we definitely do. Science. I'm going to figure that stuff out for you. So, yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not wholly opposed. And, but, and like I said, we, I mean, we introduce so much stuff intentionally or unintentionally anyway. I mean, I see, I mostly don't see too much trouble with it. It almost <laughs> seems like all life does that to a certain extent. We're just the only life that's kind of aware of it. See, I actually, I don't like rewilding. Yeah. The way that it's presented, at least from a U.S. perspective, I don't have as much uh, information on the European perspective as Bettina does. But um, and I hope I'm saying your name right, Bettina. I grew up with a cat named Bettina, so that's why I'm pronouncing it that way. <laughs> um, she was a great cat. cat. That's how the cat pronounced it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. She was very particular about it. In the U.S., it's typically focused around bringing African megafauna over here to live in the U S and it's presented as kind of a one, two punch of you're helping conserve the African megafauna that are endangered in that continent while also restoring the ecosystem balance back to North America. But I just don't know that either of those things would actually be true. I don't know that that's, I mean, I think reintroducing wolves to like, you know, Yellowstone and to, I think they've also introduced them to Great Smoky Mountain National Park. I would call that rewilding. Yeah, that's a type of rewilding. I think you would to kind of the most extreme example aside from Jurassic Park. Right. (laughs) Or cloning the mammoth, I guess. I'll rephrase my statement then. Um, I think rewilding, if you can basically get the exact same species from a nearby distribution and move it back into its old distribution or range uh, is one thing. Introducing what you perceive to be an analog species to a species that is completely extinct is another thing. So, for example, um, the people who talk about... Are you fine if we can uh, clone a mammoth and put it back? I mean, the, the climate has changed so much that I'm not sure how happy the mammoth would be. Sounds like Ryan's opposed to teleportation in space or time. (laughs) <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of cloning the mammoth, if I'm being totally honest, but like there are people who want to reintroduce the Bolson tortoise to the United States, and it's a, a large uh, desert tortoise that's still alive in Mexico, so it's only locally extinct in the United States, and they just want to kind of redistribute it to what its paleo range was, and hey, similar to the wolves. No, that's fine, and I mean, a tortoise has a very low potential to become an invasive pest <laughs> species, right? It's a tortoise. Um know. I mean, but like the, some of those frog, like those, the cane, is that right? The cane frog in Australia, man, some things go wild and you wouldn't expect it. Yeah. But I mean, that's, that's moving it to a completely different continent yeah, as opposed to true. just helping it live a little bit further North than it currently does. And I think that's a wholly different proposition than saying, let's bring African elephants and cheetahs and put them on a ranch in Texas and just let it go. Cause there are some rewilding proponents who talk about that too. So I actually was on an episode of generation Anthropocene, uh, where this was our topic. We talked about it in some detail with Miles Trayer and Leslie Chang. And so I can put a link to that in the show notes where I get into like a lot of the nitty gritty. Yeah. How did Miles and Leslie feel about it? I mean, I think they kind of deferred to me as the more bio person of the trio. Sure. But, you know, I think there there is a deep time Miles perspective. Miles is a geophysicist. What's Leslie's background again? Uh, she mostly does radio stuff. So. Oh, cool. Um, she, she studied, you know, uh, geology and earth science, but is more of a creative writing and, and uh, radio production person. Mm-hmm. So, so there's this concept uh, that I read about when I was looking into rewilding myself called Frankenstein ecosystems, where you claim that you're recreating an ecosystem that used to exist, but really you're just sewing disparate parts back together and hoping it functions. Yeah. And I don't really support that. Niches are such a hard thing to define. I mean, you just look at any like logistic curve or marchetti curve of anything that lives and dies and trying to like decide when one curve will take over another based on the species and the niche it's trying to fill. I mean, I don't know how you could possibly predict what exactly niche a different species actually assumes or whatever. Uh, I mean, partly because it's always changing, right? Right. Now, if you guys feel like going on a bit of a road trip, uh, this is in northeastern Siberia. There is a group actively working on this, and it's called Pleistocene Park. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, And the idea there, and I think you might be interested in this, Charlie, is 
Studies have shown that tundra ecosystems are more stable when you have herbivorous megafauna on the landscape because yeah, they when they pull the up moss and stuff. Yeah, yeah, they trample the moss and they when they eat uh plants that get pulled up by the root, you know, so small grasses and shrubs, they aerate the soil, which helps keep it right. cooler, so it prevents some of the more negative effects of uh permafrost thawing out. Um, so that's really cool. And they're doing it with, you know, native taxa like uh, reindeer and muskox and stuff. And the idea is they're trying to recreate the, the ecosystem service that would be provided by mammoths, but they're not actively talking about bringing wow. elephants up in bring them, Siberia. Bring the mammoths, man. Well, yeah, if we could clone the mammoth, this would be the perfect place to, to go put them until it melts. But <laughs> did, did <laughs> like we I kill the mammoths, where, where'd melts. they go? Uh, that That's another issue with the Pleistocene rewilding argument is – if you accept the premise that the Pleistocene extinction was a human hunting driven extinction, then some people claim we have a moral obligation to restore that ecosystem that we destroyed. But if you believe that it was a climate motivated extinction, then it's not human's fault that these animals aren't here anymore. It was just, it was their time um, from a climate sense. And especially since the climate change that happened at the end Pleistocene was a period of global warming in the end of the last ice age. And how fair is it to try to rewild to in a time and place where we're <laughs> yeah. actively undergoing another period of intense global warming? Yeah. I mean, would you place this more? I don't, I don't know about that argument. I'm just saying that is the argument that is made. I'm not trying to argue it myself. Yeah. Or say that it's what I feel. And, and I personally believe that, uh, the, the Pleistocene extinction was a one-two punch, right? It was a common, at least in North America, which is, again, where I have the best perspective on this rewilding question. Um, I think it, it had to be some combination of human hunting pressure and the end of the last ice age. I'm not sure how you disentangle those two entirely. Yeah, well, I don't know. In a million years, when you look back at, like, Africa, what would you would you say that's... Yeah, it would be impossible to untangle climate change in humans today, I think. Yeah, that's a really good point. I hadn't thought about it from a future future perspective. I mean, I think it's pretty clear that we're like, you know, shooting all the rhinos. <laughs> but we're also <laughs> doing the climate the present, change too. But I think it would be, so I know, I would but it'd be hard to tell, I think, looking back. No, that's a good point. That's a, re that's a really good point. I mean, I guess now we at least have better records. So we know that it's a one-two punch <laughs> instead of just having to infer it based on the fossil record. Um, so I think it's, I think it's really complicated. I don't think there's one right answer or opinion. And I think it varies from continent to continent as Bettina pointed out. So mm -hmm. as much as I would love to go to Texas and watch cheetahs run around, I just don't know that it's the best idea. I mean, you pretty much can, right? There's, there's parks there that already have, you know, that are, they're basically like trophy hunting parks in Texas. So yeah. that's basically already happened. I don't know how, I don't know how, how that ecosystem's working or if it, you know, you could just let it go and it would keep going. I don't know. Um, but I, I think the, the, the field study is available if somebody wants to do it. A better question might be, what about like not rewilding, but re-domesticating? Like, let's make some, some pygmy woolly mammoths that I can have as a pet. <laughs> well, you should just put them on an island for a while. Cause there were really tiny woolly mammoths towards the end of their, their run. I like what I like to point out to people is that the last ground sloths and woolly mammoths went extinct after the pyramids had already been built. So relatively recent and especially from a paleontological sense. Yeah, that's crazy. I yeah. Totally and that wild separated them in time. There's like you can find posts online that are like 16 things that'll blow your sense of time. And one of them is like Oxford University was founded while the Aztec Empire was still at its height. Is, so that just the like, number, is that the number nine that I'll never guess? You'll never guess number nine. Number nine will blow you away. Yeah, they, they often do have clickbaity titles, but I enjoy the perspective nonetheless. Yeah. You should probably drink a glass of wine before reading number four. <laughs> hey, well, if you're going to have a glass of wine, you should tell us what it is, and you can do that in our next segment, which is What Are You Drinking? Coming up next.
an episode of Science Sort Of if we didn't also talk about what we are drinking. Since I read the first email, and I think I think I have the most appropriate drink, I'm going to go first. So, this is maybe the weirdest thing I've ever drank <laughs> on the show. Can't be worse than some of Ben's. Was it Pepto Bismol? No, no. Uh, in honor of Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. uh, I oh, am is drinking this one of the Jones sodas. No. Well, I, do, do they do like Thanksgiving flavors? Yeah. Close. Uh, I am drinking some epic artisanal bone broth. <laughs> Time honored sipping broth. Man, all the hippies are all about that right now. There's so many different bone broths all over Bellingham, Washington. I've, I have not tried one yet. I'm incredibly hesitant because it I have doesn't... one in my fridge because a friend gave it to me and said it saved my life or something. <laughs> Apparently it's got all kinds of collagen and minerals and gelatins in it. And the, this, this one is turkey, cranberry, and sage. So that seemed perfect. And I'm going to try it and then I, I might not like it. <laughs> Sounds kind of, sage is a very powerful flavor. It's kind of like hops. It'll kind of run over anything you do wrong. It's a little salty. Definitely tastes like turkey broth. Mm. I mean, it's not. What kind of vessel is it in? Uh, it comes in a little like brown mini mason jar thing. I was but, gonna say um, they all come in mason jars because it's got to be hip, right? But I, I, and I you're heated supposed it. to just drink it like this. It's not no, I heated it up in uh, in my coffee mug, uh, okay. and I'm just sipping oh, it out of that. That's gross. Actually, you'll probably never be able to drink coffee out of that mug again <sighs> without thinking you taste turkey cranberry sage. Yeah, it's it's weird. It's healthy. Um. Is it hell? I mean, and it's got nine grams of protein. <laughs> Small batch. I would hate to have macro produced broth juice. <laughs> oh man, this is this is yeah, weird. Ben would, ben would be proud. Macro broth juice. Now it's like one percent <laughs> less mad cow disease. Mm. Ugh. Yeah, I'm gonna need a. I'm gonna need a chaser. Um. My backup is Put a the, shot at it. <laughs> uh, my backup is a tall boy of Surly Hell Lager. Surly, the brewery out of uh, the Twin Cities area of Minnesota. Or, uh, actually, it's a Hellas Lager. Brooklyn Center. Um, it's actually a Zwickel beer, so um, an unfiltered lager with American hops and Pilsner malts. That's a good clean, clean counterbalance to the bone broth. Yeah, it's. Um, you need something like mezcal or lager. I, the lager is actually working working nice for me. I also had this because um, I figured after our election here in America, this might be a particularly surly Thanksgiving for most people, depending on which you know uncle shows up. Yeah. So, what about you, Charlie? I'm drinking a Multipotiano de Bruzzo. Is that a wine? Yeah, it's an Italian table wine. It's it's good though. It's um, it's a dirty wine. It's like leathery and earthy and acidic. Oh, and okay. Dark, dark fruits. It's a good good winter hearty wine. Usually you pair it with like uh, um, sausage or meat sauces. But I'm drinking it straight, no chaser, because that's how I do. <laughs> yeah. Table wine, straight, no chaser. <laughs> I'm Leave hard the like bottle that. in a dirty glass. <laughs> no, no, I like I like my dirty wines. Um, so, like Pinot is a dirty wine too, but it's light. This is a dirty wine that's that's heavy. Heavier. Got some body. Yeah. Cool. What about you, Patricio? Um, so I'm drinking a beer that you guys will probably snub. Let's see. So this is a an all day IPA from Founders. No, that's a good beer. Yeah. Good. Why would we snub that? Mm. Well, they're um, I like them, but I wasn't sure if they were possibly have been. So I'm buying. They they come in a fifteen. You can get fifteen in a I guess a for what would normally be the price of twelve. Um, you can get them in a fifteen pack of cans. Um, so I was unsure if they maybe been bought by somebody more dubious. Um, but yeah, I've been appreciating them because they're pretty economical when you buy them that way. Well, and I, I mean, I personally am a big fan of the um, sessionable IPA movement. Mm -hmm. Me too. 
apparently they were bought by, or at least 30% owned by a larger group, uh, a Spanish brewing company hmm. from Madrid, Grupo Mahu San Miguel. But, um, I mean, I've, you know, I've been a fan of Founders for years and I've, if they, if the, if the quality has dropped because of uh, 30% foreign ownership, I have not noticed. So nice. Great. Well, yeah, I'm appreciating it. Like I said, you you can get them for let's see, yeah, like a they're like a dollar a beer, maybe a little less when you buy them in that fifteen pack. Not bad. No, the session IPAs are great because. Oh yeah, I mean, they're definitely less than a dollar. You don't get a hangover from them, and they, uh, you know, some IPAs you can just hide bad brewing with a lot of booze and a lot of hops, and you can't. Yeah, do that's that true. With a session IPA. And I think the all-day IPA is of my favorite of the session IPAs that I've tried, and you know I've tried a fair fair number. And yeah, they do a lot of other good beers too. I mean, I don't think I've ever had a beer from Founders that I thought was bad. You know, I find you don't get a hangover if you pair each beer with a mug full of broth. I thought you were going to say science. Nope, broth. <laughs> but science helps too. I'm not sure it'll prevent the hangover, but it'll at least tingle your neurons back into functioning. And so let's talk about some more science in our next segment. Coming up next. Now listen to this. I used to think that you were really cool. I used to think that you never would be nobody's fool. Let me tell you, baby, you're Give me a straight. in our all listener extravaganza is an email sent well to all of us but to be read by charlie all right let's see here so this is a lengthy one a lot of rapid fire science questions so think of it like potato chips you know have a few bites recover and then get on to the next one so hey guys a couple of things wait who is this even by it's keith from new york so keith from new york writes hey guys a couple of things First, I recently made my first purchase from Amazon using your affiliate link, but when it redirects me to Amazon, I do not see any indication that a connection of any kind is made with Science Sort of. How can I be sure that you guys are getting your cut? I looked back at last year and saw that I spent a significant amount of money at Amazon, 1400 bucks, and as a loyal listener, I am committed to using your link as much as possible this year. I'm a recurring donor as well. I want to see you guys thrive. Well, so actually, Charlie, can I touch on this real quick first? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Amazon thing. So on our main website, we have a link directly to Amazon that is linked to our science sort of affiliate account. And you should see, you know, a much longer URL than just your basic Amazon.com. And somewhere in that URL, it should say tag equals science sort of. It'll only work if you have cookies enabled. So if you are running a browser that has cookies disabled, then... Or ad blocker, possibly. I've not had any problems with ad blocker, but definitely the cookies, because what it's doing is that link that you click is putting a cookie in your browser for that session of purchasing at Amazon. So it only lasts for that one until you close that tab or window. And it, Amazon reads that cookie to know that you came from us. Also, in the show notes, whenever I link to like a book or a song or sometimes I can find ben we- Ben's Weird Juices on Amazon, those links are all also custom links that d- drive you to our Amazon portal. But they anything you buy, once you click through on that link, still goes to us. So if you're not sure if things are going through and you've like bought something super weird, we can see what is being purchased. We can't see who is purchasing it or where it's going or anything like that. But if you wanted to double check with us, you know, say like, here's a super specific item that I bought on this date and I I can look at the back end and see if it's going through properly or not. Um, if that's a concern that people have, <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, good faith effort, go to the website, click the link or set, set our link on the website as your, as your bookmark. And you're, you're doing more than enough, more than we can ask. So, yeah. But it definitely helps. And this time of year, it really helps. Yeah, for sure. So Black Friday shopping and all that. Yeah, so do it. Not every time, but if you're buying something big, go through us. 
Or every time. Or every time, if if you're OCD about it. Train your OCD in productive ways. Okay, we're talking about science though, right? We you were. know it. All right, so here comes the here comes the onslaught of potato chips. Number one, why do so many vertebrates have five digits? What was the first five-digit ancestor? And has anyone studied if five is optimized? Insects have six legs and four wings. Ten. That's six <laughs> plus four, I guess. Common divisor, five. Coincidence? I'm going to say yes, coincidence. <laughs> I'm going to agree with Patrick on that one. Um, so real quick, a couple of things to note. I mean, vertebrates having five digits, obviously insects aren't vertebrates. Um, also, it's important to make a distinction between vertebrates and tetrapods. So all fish, which have zero digits because they don't have limbs, are still vertebrates. Um, so you have to make sure that you're thinking about land, you know, terrestrial tetrapods. So the fish that have, you know, the Tiktaalik lineage that evolved from Sarcopterygian fish onto yeah. land. But even the Sarcopterygian fish start start showing the some of the same patterns that set up this five digit. Yes. Right, right. But in those early, early tetrapod vertebrates, you do see many, many more digits. Yeah, you see a lot of of experimentation. Right. <laughs> yeah. Seven or nine or something. Yeah. Eight, yeah. So so there are uh, different numbers of digits in the fossil record, and it seems to be that the reduction of digits uh, it allows you to rearrange your bones into more of a, a wrist and ankle structure, uh, which helps with flexion and support during movement against gravity uh, and supporting yourself under your uh, legs as opposed to kind of a splayed out pattern. It's also worth pointing out that lots of tetrapod vertebrates have actually continued to reduce the number of digits below five. So like sloths have two and three digits <laughs> respectively. Example. Horses have one. Um, so there, there are lots of Examples in evolution where the reduction of digits kept going for some functional purpose. And then and then you have like the even weirder examples like cetaceans, mammals, you know, tetrapod vertebrates that have re-evolved into a marine habitat. I would, even though they've got the bones inside the flippers, I would argue that they have technically zero digits. One mm, digit maybe. Mm, I don't know. Kind of just a big flapper. No, but they, they use, nah. they use the, the bones to articulate and change the shape of their, their flipper yeah. to make it act more aerodynamically or hydrodynamically. Plus, yeah, I agree. And in kind of like a gee whiz kind of thing, if you, if you sort of start at your, you know, if you start at your shoulder, you've got your, your humerus, which is one bone, your ulna and radius, which is two bones. You've got seven wrist bones, which is three and four. If you want to think of them that way, and then you've got five fingers. So the the Sarcopterygian fish sort of set up this pattern of like adding adding one extra bone with each step, and I I guess five was just a reasonable place to sort of cut it off. Yeah, and um, currently amongst living tetrapods, there are no animals that have more than five. So five is currently the max, but that's not what we see in the fossil record. So what about Gattaca? There's that piano player with six yep. fingers on each hand and he can only play that piece with six fingers. Mm. So or the, the pandas, the pandas thumbs. That's not really the same thing at all. Well, it's a six digit that they've evolved. Uh, it's, it's sort of, I mean, it's a, it's a modified wrist bone. That serves as a six digit, but... What's crazy is you could think of how to use that six digit. Like, you can just try to, like, move your thumb, then move your pointer, then move your your middle finger, then your ring finger, and then your pinky, and you can totally picture how to move that six digit. But, I mean, part... <laughs> <laughs> like, part of the reason that we're able to think that way, Charlie, is because we've decoupled our hands from our locomotion, right? Being pi We have a very skewed perspective on this because we're bipedal. Oh. Uh. So if we want to like use augmented augmented reality to control like like a biomech, have it tap into like the hand part of our brain or something. I'm sure a human could figure out how to work a sixth digit in a functional way, but like you can imagine that with your hand because you use your hand to manipulate stuff. What would you do with a sixth toe? I can picture that too. I can't picture <laughs> I can't picture like a finger coming off my knee though very well. But what about a bit of prehensile tail? That'd be pretty cool. I can picture that. That's fine. Yeah, I don't know how that would work out. I mean, I, you know, I just feel like squeezing my like glutes a lot. I don't know if I'd actually be wiggling a tail. You know. Joe's getting a little weird. <laughs> well, I did. I did find a, a short-ish article 
on Scientific American about uh, this exact topic. So I'll link to that in the show notes if uh, Keith or anyone else wants to dig a little deeper. We, All right. Yeah, we we, should this, probably... These are potato chips. Let's keep on going. Oh, yeah. That's, that's why I said that. All right. So what is the relationship between shrimp and cockroaches? How far up the taxonomical tree do I have to go to find their closest common ancestor? How about spiders? All three of those are phylum arthropoda, and that is the taxonomic rank you have to go up to to get them into the same group. Uh, shrimp are crustaceans within the class Malacostraca. Cockroaches are uh, in uh, hexapoda, uh, and the subgroup for that is insecta, so there are uh, six-legged arthropods that are not technically insects. And then um, spiders are in the class arachnid, uh, and that is the subphylum Chelicerata, which includes things like scorpions and horseshoe crabs um, and some extinct groups. So you actually have to go pretty far up to find their most recent common ancestor, but they're all related by being arthropods. Shrimp tastes good. Does that mean cockroaches and spiders taste good? I've heard that... Like tarantula tastes like crab, and I believe it. I've seen my daughter when she was two, she ate a spider, and I looked at her. And I was <laughs> like, what did that taste like? And she shrugged and just said, tastes like bugs. I mean, there are, there are a lot of like taco places that are serving cricket tacos now, and I think those are good. Yeah, and I guess I'll just point out um, quickly that of those three groups, like the current thinking is that the, the shrimps and cockroaches are the closer of the two relatives. Mm. The spiders are... Or less related than those two. I buy that. Next one. Ready. Did sex evolve multiple times like eyes, or did it come about in only one common ancestor to plants and animals? If so, kudos to the inventor of sex. I think that's a one-time thing. I agree. I looked into it a little bit, and not only is it a single common ancestor between plants and animals, it is a single common ancestor between Plants, animals, fungi, and protists from a single-celled eukaryotic species estimated to have existed about 1.2 billion years ago. But how did it get invented? Uh, just through genetic recombination between two or more individuals to get a, you know, a, yeah, a re yeah, okay. recombined genetic sequence in the offspring to prevent deleterious uh, mutations from propagating. But that meant there, there was like some... There are some s organisms alive for a while that could choose to reproduce by themselves or have sex. Yeah, there still are. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and there are a few species that have actually lost the ability to have sex, which is interesting. Uh, and usually it's like a, a donkey? Good, uh, no, cause I mean, that's not a naturally occurring <laughs> animal. Uh, there are certain species of lizard that have evolved to be all female and they are still capable of laying eggs, but those eggs are all clones of the mother because there's no sperm being introduced, so they have the same genetic sequence as the mother. And that I introduces... <laughs> yeah, you're right. I shouldn't have said donkeys are not naturally occurring. I'm sorry, donkeys. There's actually a story about donkeys I want to do for an upcoming episode, so donkeys will get their due. Um, and the problem with reproducing asexually with something that has a pretty complex genetic sequence is that mutations are going to happen naturally at a certain rate. And if you don't recombine your DNA with another member of your own species, those mutations persist. And it's a, uh, a thing called Mueller's ratchet. I guess Mueller was the biologist that figured it out. Mm -hmm. And it essentially is a ratchet that clinks forward, but can't clink backwards because you're not recombining the genetics. So sex resets Mueller's ratchet. But if you don't have sex, that ratchet just keeps cranking and cranking until there are too many genetic deficiencies for the animal to even be viable and survive, and then the species goes extinct. So it's a it can be a relatively efficient short-term strategy, but in the long run, sex seems better for the maintenance of a, a species. But it does mean mortality. Right, yeah. I mean, sex introduces all kinds of other complications like sexual selection, where you develop these traits that make no sense for survival but get you mates, and uh, all kinds of all kinds of fun quirks like that. All right, so now moving from biology to physics. So there's still Keith from New York. He's just popping them off. <laughs> All right, so is the Schrodinger, Schrodinger wave function smoothish or quantum jumpy? If the latter, so I guess that means quantum jumpy, does that mean that quantum scientists cannot use differential equations and calculus is useless to them? The ref differential equations require a continuous function, so I guess that's what he meant by that question. Um, but I'm going to defer to Ben Tippett, the fourth 
paleo pal to help me out. He writes, they're smooth for the most part. So differential <laughs> equations and calculus are used. I don't know if he's talking about sex still or the... Way <laughs> so smooth. Smooth for the most part. That's all I know about that. I don't know what the hell anybody's talking about at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Something to do with cats in a box. <laughs> yeah. But I know, I know when I learned the wave equation, Schrodinger's wave equation, it was most certainly a differential equation because it had different... It was an equation that, requ- that required an integral and uh, derivatives on either side of the equal equal sign. So it's it's a differential equation. You had to take a lot of integrals, so that means calculus, I think. But I, I've kind, kind of repressed a lot of those memories. All right, next next potato this, chip. Uh, this broth is not getting better the more I drink it. Mm. The bone broth? <laughs> yeah. Surprising. <laughs> Just tastes like it's concentrating in flavor. But anyway... You could do something with it, like it, it could. You could use it as a base for a. That's a what soup. I'm. Oh, nice winter. You soup. know, like how people used to use broths before they started. Buying yeah, this is this a crazy idea. <laughs> Cut up some celery, carrots, and onions, saute yeah. it in oil for about ten minutes. Then pour the broth over it, and then if you would like to, you could put a little ham hock or mm-hmm. some chicken breast in there, and you got a stew Maybe going, some baby. Noodles. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Carl. All right, next one. What do we got? What do we got? Okay, we did sex. We did wave equation. Um, if wave functions are additive, then how do colliders for force particles to be? How do colliders force particles to behave like particles and collide, rather than passing through each other like waves? Is it a matter of allowing them to add and then catching the resulting product on a measuring device? Oh man, this is way beyond me. Um, so I'm going to use a little bit of a Feynman analogy that I read a long time ago. But first, I'm going to use the use a Ben's. Yeah. Ben's help. So Phone Ben writes, um, the wave functions being additive thing is a property indi- of, a, of individual particles which may interact with themselves. Is that the, like reproducing without? <laughs> um, the wave function describes where the particle might be, and so interactions between particles are governed by their wave functions as well, but those aren't additive. I have no idea what Ben's talking about still. Yeah. Um, so I asked him to be succinct. <laughs> the way I think about this is goes back to one of the, the analogies Feynman used, and he said that that particles, photons, photons are particles of light. Um, heavy particles are particles of matter, like electrons, uh, protons, neutrons, etc. They behave as both particles and waves, and so you have this huge field of time space that's rippling the same way waves do in a swimming pool not exactly the same but that's that's the analogy right and so when those waves peak in certain ways then the particle basically presents itself um so you can have you can make a big splash in a pool and two waves will collide and make constructive or deconstructive interference and that's that's the particle becoming more particle like than wave like and we can sense these things, right? With our eyes, we can sense photons. With different um, measuring devices, we can sense electrons and and uh, protons and neutrons, etc. The question was, how do colliders force particles to behave like particles and collide? So, if you have this, you know, wavy swimming pool, how do you get these waves to not just pass through each other, but actually interact? And this is where I'm stepping off my knowledge. My knowledge of physics basically ends with the turn of the the 20th century. So thermodynamics, uh, Newtonian mechanics, that stuff I'm great at. Um, go beyond that, I start getting confused because I don't know how to touch it or or, or understand it as well. So um, why they don't pass straight through each other is because they have an electromagnetic magnetic field. So they they they. They don't actually touch each other, but they know they sense each other's presence through their electromagnetic um, uh, interactions. I mean, it's the same reason why I'm not passing through the chair I'm sitting through right, sitting on right now, um, even though that there's so much empty space between uh, the the nucleus of an atom and the electrons orbiting it. There's this electromagnetic force that's maintaining um, my position on the chair rather than me just sinking through it to the center of the earth. Uh, So they don't actually really like collide the same way two pool balls do or two baseballs do, but they, they get close enough to, to each other that they sense each other's presence and 
if they get really close, then there can be highly energetic uh, interactions that produce different kinds of particles. And that's about all I know. Hopefully that helps. And if that made no sense or it pissed you off and you're a real physicist, please write in. <laughs> so we can cover your feedback in a year. <laughs> yeah. Next, did life emerge from the sea more than once or was there one species that crawled out like in the New Yorker cartoons? Well, it's it's emerged from the sea a couple of times within within vertebrates. And probably invertebrates too, like the coconut crab. Yeah. yeah. Well, and don't forget plants. Nah, sure. we'll forget those guys. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they were first, Charlie. We couldn't. Nothing could have made it up onto land if the plants hadn't colonized it first to provide land food. Yeah. So life's emerged a, a few times for sure. Yeah. Definitely not just the one. So the New York. I mean, the, the New Yorker cartoon is again. It's that. That's, that's vertebrate. Tetrapod sensor. vertebrate. Yeah, yeah. Bias that ignores. But the even. Role of, but even that. You know. I think. Um, I'm pro New Yorker cartoon. <laughs> you want to simplify simplify it and make it straightforward for the sake of humor yeah don't <laughs> let's not ruin jokes but there's usually already vascular plants growing on the land that the little tetrapod is crawling up onto so well i mean some people think that snakes came from well maybe that's a return it, it's com- it's definitely complicated but but life has definitely come out of the ocean more than once has it yeah, gone I mean, back it, into the ocean yeah uh, lots of times yeah, yeah have you like seen a whales. manatee <laughs> Oh, no, or a swimming sloth. <laughs> there was actually a species of sloth or a genus of sloth that is was pretty exclusively marine. We find them like with whale fossils. I, yeah. It was like a big shaggy otter. Hey, otters, that's another one. <laughs> don't and forget the mustelids. Bear, give polar bears another million years, which yep. they yeah. don't have. They but, don't have. <laughs> but they would probably uh, go back to the ocean. Hippos. Desmos Islands. Sort of. For our Japanese listeners. <laughs> All right. What they love Desmond Islands. Um, it's like a marine. It's like a marine hippo, Charlie. Just in case. Next you're... question, bio nerds. This one's a physics one. How come <laughs> the nuclear strong force acts powerfully only over short distances? Does it not fade with the square of the distance like the other forces? You know, Keith from New York. This is a question I've always had too, and I never took um, particle physics, so I don't know the answer to this. Let's uh, see what Ben has to say. Ben says, see episode 59 of the Titanium Physicist podcast on the strong force. The short answer is that stretching two quarks far enough apart for the force to change at all requires so much energy that new quarks are generated. Duh. <laughs> is that I don't see why this is even a question after that explanation. I know, just go listen to Ben's show. Well, it kind of, yeah. I mean, you, you think of it more like a, a spring, right? So you can... yes. You stretch them apart, but then at some point the spring just breaks. That's a great, that's a great metaphor, Patrick. You got a knack for this. These are also, and I don't have a good explanation for why, why it only works over short distances. But it is the reason, like we don't get, you know, why the atoms on the is. I think maybe it still continues to work, but other forces just completely dominate. Well, that that could be too. I mean, that you know, that's part of the reason you can't build like a huge atom. The, the weak force begins to dominate. Over well, and the electromagnetic forces. Right? Yeah. As well, those those protons want to push each other apart at more than the strong force can hold it all together. Um, yeah, man, that's uh, that's a good question, and I only vaguely have a vague inclination for why it, why it should work that way. Uh, do you guys want to tackle this last one or save it for another time since it's kind of a big, bigger discussion? Uh, we can answer it, it. We each have to answer it in less than one sentence. Yeah, I think okay. it, I think it's perfect going into a uh, trailer just, trash talk. Yeah, we oh, just have they to don't, answer people, it. Oh. We were to do a trailer trash talk. Uh, that you is, just blew the reveal, <laughs> Patrick. Son of a... Yeah, you can How dare out. you? Ugh, fine. Go ahead, Charlie. Read read the final the final little tag. And finally, I'd love to hear a discussion of suspension of disbelief in films. How does it work for each of you individually? I mean, for me, you can give me all the standard Star Trek stuff, gravity being suitable on the spaceship and every planet they visit, transporters, aliens who speak English, travel faster than light, etc. But some things I cannot accept. Lightsabers are one of those. I cannot wrap, wrap my brain around how they would work, and I find those scenes laughable. So what works for each of you and why? Thanks, and keep up the good work. 
I don't know what works. I mean, I think I you used one to sentence. Be, okay, I used to be really good at um, suspending my disbelief. As I get older, I think it gets harder. But in general, I think in the moment of watching the film, I'm fine. And it's only later that I look back and go, that's probably not going to work very well. For me, as I get older, the suspension of disbelief when it comes to science is much easier to let go. And I have a much harder time accepting when characters do things that are illogical or uh, clearly just to drive the plot forward instead of what a human would actually do in that moment. So for me, that's that's where I get annoyed is when the characters themselves are behaving inconsistently or uh, non-logically. Agreed. Before I had children, I was a deconstructionist because I wanted to see how the world worked and I would like to take things apart even if it meant destroying things because it made me <laughs> feel smart and more knowledgeable. Now that I have children, I want to make the world a prettier place. And so I certainly hold my... Uh, I heard, so certainly suspend my disbelief at this point with most everything. Well, there you go. Hey, speaking of uh, films, since Patrick already blew the reveal... It's time for the one-time return of everyone's or no one's favorite segment. And that segment is called Trailer Trash Talk. TTT. Hey, y'all! <laughs> oh, Jamie's going to be thrilled. It's been a while. It's Trailer Trash Talk. Well, as you probably guessed from hearing the intro, the dulcet banjo tones, we are returning to an old segment for one episode only, Trailer Trash Talk. Yeah. Uh, it's been suggested by a few of our listeners that we do a throwback to Trailer Trash Talk. Uh, most recently, Clay the Human um, asked us to bring it back and didn't suggest a film for us to do, so we uh, we looked around the internet, saw what interesting looking sci-fi movies were coming up, and decided on Passengers. Yeah, <laughs> sci-fi. Uh, Chris Pat, Chris Pratt, Jennifer Lawrence on a starship to another galaxy. Well, another solar system, anyway. Uh, they're supposed to be asleep, hibernating. hibernating. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that word. <laughs> and then they. Uh, they wake up too soon. They're the only two people on the ship who wake up too soon, apparently. And so they're on a giant a giant ship, just the two of them. Um, and they figure out it's, it's, in fact, way too soon, like 90 years too soon. And uh, then stuff starts to go wrong. <laughs> get weird. Seems like, yeah, get yes. weird. And there's going to be some reveal as to why they were woken up 90 years, or 30 years into their 120-year journey. So definitely far enough away from Earth that I can't imagine rescue is an option if you're already 30, 30 years out. And then and but, yeah, if they're anywhere near light speed, then they can't even communicate anymore. Right, and so um, kind of a cool concept. I, I like the potential for the psychological hoops you'd have to jump through as a person who wakes up with the rest of your life stuck on a ship with one other person. The trailer kind of indicates that they seem to work through that pretty fast. <laughs> Yeah, towards the end of the trailer, it looks like other people are showing up on the ship. So I don't know how that's going to work if other people will start waking up or, or what the what the plan is there. But it seems like for whatever reason, they can't just put themselves back into hibernation. Yeah. And at a certain point, the ship itself needs their their awakeness for its own rescue or something like yeah. that. It's I guess least... it's handy that they're both like super attractive. Like yeah, what if one of them was really ugly and the other one was really attractive? That'd be difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yes, real real trial and tribulation there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I sort of like the, at least, hope that maybe they'll balance some of the traditional sci-fi 
um, sort of quiet space stories like Solaris and and maybe 2001 with it with the more action oriented movie. Um, but hopefully, I, it doesn't go completely idiotic like Event Horizon. Like we don't yeah. need to open a dimension to hell to make. Well, this it does this movie. does have Lawrence Fishburne in the cast, so he might be reprising his role from Event Horizon. <laughs> right. And what about and what's your comment about uh, Sunshine, Charlie? Um, it was great until like a zombie. Appeared. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't mind the the solar zombie or whatever it was. That didn't bother me. I don't know why everybody's down on that part. I I haven't rewatched the movie in a long time. Uh, It is weird that the human torch freezes to death at one point. I don't know. I'm a weirdo. I'm more into like the moon slash Solaris slash. Well, moon's great. You know what I tried to watch recently? I tried to watch the Warcraft movie, also directed by Duncan Jones. (laughs) (laughs) Part of a bad movie nights. We were watching it on purpose to make fun of it, but it was it was so bad that it almost wasn't worth making fun of. Apparently, that was that was a really big deal in in China, right? Oh yeah, it'll probably get a sequel just based on the the Chinese box office alone. Huh. Huh. They really liked it. So they're on this they're on this kind of cool looking ship, and it was an interesting design for a ship because it looked very it had that like kind of fragile look for a ship that could only exist in space, like couldn't ever land in anywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I tell you, it looks exactly like I have this um great long attachment that goes on my like power drill to mix some um, like a five gallon bucket of paint or whatever. It looks exactly mm-hmm. like that attachment. Oh yeah. Yeah, double helix kind of thing yeah. going. Oh uh, yeah, it does kind of have a double helix look. And the the oh. ship's name is Avalon, which is the uh, legendary island in Arthurian lore where King Arthur would, would go and it looks like the ship's AI might be named Arthur, or at least the bartender that's the human facade for the AI. Yeah, top half human, lower half robot. I still I still think it, it might be sponsored by Toyota. <laughs> Toyota Avalon, it's a reliable car. This ship doesn't look too reliable. Yeah. I'll the take car, my check uh, yeah, later. The planet they're going to is called Tundra. I'm kidding. Oh, okay. I didn't see that anywhere. Totally kidding. Oh. It's just another Toyota. Oh. I mean, because that would be a little too on the nose with Interstellar in the world. Suppo- the, the planet that's supposedly being inhabitable is a giant tundra. Mm-hmm. But as we know, all all planets that are not Earth are all just one thing. <laughs> right, exactly. They're they're monotone. All across. Yeah, the, Mono-bio- the simulation. Bio-bio-bio-bio. I mean, we live in a simulation. We used all the RAM for the Earth. <laughs> so you can't have good textures anywhere else. I'm pretty sure this is what people have been complaining about with No Man's Sky. Yeah. <laughs> I was really hoping at least one of you would get and laugh at. And so it looks like Charlie is in my in my video game corner there. Yeah, I I didn't buy it. I don't I don't pre-purchase video games. I'm too old for that. <laughs> oh, I didn't buy it either. But I'm still even with all the super negative reviews. I'm like, but it still sounds really cool. It still sounds cool. <laughs> <laughs> so so are you guys? I guess we don't really do Hollywood stock exchange stuff anymore. But oh, no. since we seem, you know, since movies nowadays seem to just be <laughs> what you do when you're not watching 12 hours of television in a row. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Superheroes, live action remakes of Disney cartoons or <laughs> studios trying to discover the next Harry Potter, including just making more Harry more Potter Harry type Potter. movies. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of nice to get what seems to be an original concept that I, as far as I know, it's not based off of a comic or a book or anything like that. Right. Yeah. They were like, okay, we'll give you two people. <laughs> but it's also like two of the biggest people in Hollywood it is. It is. right it is. now. And it's interesting. I wish I wish I knew what year this movie was theoretically set in because the ship itself looks way beyond the the technology that we'd be able to build at mm-hmm. the moment, but everything inside the ship, including the Roombas, yeah. The Roombas, the spacesuits, uh, you know, all that tech looks like it's not too far away. It's kind of maybe what we could pull off now. Yeah, it has a very like 60s Modern aesthetic, Madman aesthetic. Everywhere. Yeah, Madman in space, for sure. <laughs> but it also looks like they've got some sort of artificial gravity system, which is way, way beyond what we have access to right now. But it also the the towards the end of the trailer it includes one of what to me is one of the scariest. It's just centrifugal force. That's why it has a double helix that's rotating. Yeah, I could. I guess I couldn't quite tell from the quick shots we saw how much it was rotating or not. But there's a moment in the trailer where the gravity seems to fail and Jennifer Lawrence gets stuck inside a water bubble. And mm-hmm. that to me is like the scariest thing. Like an in, I mean, I guess it could happen to an insect, right? Like an ant could get stuck in a water bubble. Totally. That is a freaky thing. Like, because you would be swimming, but you wouldn't be able to get out of it, right? 
right? You'd be mm-hmm. stuck. You'd drown inside this bubble of water that is with the the surface yeah, literally it's around gonna you. Try to make us. It's going to continue to try to make a sphere around you mm-hmm. because of hydrogen mm-hmm. bonding. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So you'd be trapped in this bubble with literally salvation in any direction, but you can't reach it, and you'd you'd die. And that scares mm-hmm. me. And then that's it's like the liberal media. <laughs> so you're trapped <laughs> in a bubble that you can't escape. <laughs> Too Apparently. Soon. That's what, that's, yes, that's what I'm being told. Okay. <laughs> well, so what do you yeah. what do you guys think? It sounds like uh, it sounds like the the lack of clarity of how much this is going to be a philosophical treatise on loneliness and companionship in the void versus an action adventure romp might mm-hmm. be the deciding factor for how we each feel about it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think it all hangs in that balance, right? I hope I hope it's like seventy thirty, sixty forty introspective silence being being the heavy side there Ooh, what was that <laughs> just a spooky sound that happens on spaceships <laughs> okay all right and you know before the zombie so i hope we make it through 60 to 70 percent of the movie before the zombie shows up and so based on that hope Who do you want the antagonist to be do you want it to be chris pratt or arthur the ai i'm not arthur might actually turn out to be the I mean, well, I don't know. So, are we turning the Arthurian legend? I mean, is Arthur the? Is that? Ah, you're. Ah, you. I don't know, Charlie. Man, I, I since we said it was Avalon and and Arthur was the AI, I thought it was going to be the ultimate savior. But now you're making me think that's just a ironic mm-hmm. twist. Well, it looks like Chris Pratt's character is good with robotics. Like he's able to, you know, make the little little uh, Roomba bot do what he but wants. But it also looks like he woke up first. I think he woke up and then like was like I'm bored. And I then... think it's it seems to be filmed that way, but it's I think if only because when he finds Jennifer Lawrence's character, he's already changed into like civvies and she's still in like the hibernation jumpsuit. But I'm wondering if he has, you know, if he's good at robots and AI and stuff, he could end up being the villain. But he also, they, they clearly are setting him up to do some sort of self-sacrifice that would save the ship, but leave Jennifer Lawrence alone for oh, the yeah. rest of the 90 years. So I don't know. It's uh, I like that it's ambiguous in the trailer, but um, yeah. So Patrick, based on your, your hope for a 60-40 split uh, between introspection and action, is that hope enough to get you to want to go see this movie in theaters or is this is well i mean for... me seeing a movie in a theater you now with that that is a rare event these days so i don't know if we go that far but i definitely like the balance of the the introspection versus action in the trailer and i thought it was a really good trailer so if i didn't have kids i'd definitely go see it in the theater i'll put it that way what about you charles Oh, I totally go see this. Um, Stephen Hawking just gave a talk to the Christian Science Monitor talking about how humanity only has about 10,000 years, maybe even only 1,000 years left to live because of global warming, nukes, and or AI apocalypse. And so the, he really is making a strong push that we need to get off this planet, as is Elon Musk. And I think that's a compelling, exciting idea. And this movie kind of captures some of that sentiment, and I would I would love to see it. Do you think, I mean... Does it seem like a good use of resources to try to get 5,000 people to another solar system versus just getting a couple of hundreds of people onto other planets within our solar system? I mean, I guess you can do both at the yeah, same I, time. I think, yeah, I think Moon and Mars would be, or steps, Mars and Europa or something one and two and much more appropriate than, than going but super then, far. Unless, unless we have compelling evidence that there's, there's a, a water-rich exoplanet within a couple of light years. Hmm. Well, if this if this ship is taking 120 years to get somewhere and we can presume it's traveling at least some fraction of the speed of light, I mean, that puts a decent number of systems in its range, right? Huge number. I'm 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 sure there's a water based exoplanet within 120 light years. Why wouldn't there be? I mean, hydrogen and oxygen is super abundant and it's not too hard to get in the habitable zone of a star. Unless you get too close to the star, which it looks like the ship Avalon is going to do at some point. Hmm. It was a it was a metric uh, standard units air. <laughs> they, <laughs> they tried to do imperial units and and metric SI units in the same ship, and it's just that's a bad idea. That's why light year is a good measurement because you can't screw that up no matter which system you're using. After America failed to become great again, we had to rely on the European Space Agency. <laughs> yeah, we don't know. I mean, we if the ship is named. Work. The ship is named Avalon. We have reason to believe it. It might not. It might be more of a European effort than a, a U.S. effort. Yeah. But although Chris Pratt and Jennifer Lawrence do have American accents, 
which I guess is their mm-hmm. normal normal everyday accents anyway. So maybe by that point in the future, everyone sounds American. We can only hope. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so wait, Charlie, did you say, did you give it a thumbs up, thumbs down? I think Patrick's going thumbs up. Yeah, I'm going long. Thumbs up. And I am going long as well. Even, even if the movie ends up being more of an action space romp, I think I'll still be happy with it and uh, will enjoy watching it just because I find those two actors incredibly charismatic on the screen. And I don't think they've ever been in anything together. So it'll be fun to see how they, they both play off each other as people who are both seemingly good dramatic actors but also really funny and so I'm look and then michael sheen who's also a, a comedian slash actor um it'll be fun to see all of them kind of bounce off each other i think all right so three thumbs up there you go clay and clay and all the other people who wanted this for everyone else who didn't want this well you almost <laughs> didn't get it <laughs> <laughs> but with that we will move on to our next segment where we're going to answer some more questions from you the paleo posse see you in a minute Summer has come and passed The innocent can never last Wake me up when September ends Like my father's come to pass Seven years has gone so fast Wake me up when September ends. So hopefully everyone enjoyed a throwback to one of our classic segments, and now we are going to finish things up with uh, Patrick's Paleo Pal. All right. Um, I've got one from uh, Caesar. From, Hail Caesar. Yes. From Australia. And buses. Nobody else. Thanks for listening upside down to this podcast. Um, let's see if I can. So Caesar, um, writes in and says he's, he's heard something about something called the Az- Azola event. Is that, how, is that how you assume you pronounce that? That's uh, how I would pronounce it. And he's curious, um, curious about it. So I guess the, the Azola event happened in the past. <laughs> it happened after the, so there was a, there was an event called the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum. And so, um, at the sort of at the boundary of the Paleocene Eocene. Um, so this is after that. So dinosaurs are gone at the end of and the big and the tertiary starts, right? So that's the Paleocene. As the Paleocene shifts to the Eocene, the Earth is probably gets as hot as it's ever been. And this is the this is the event called the the PETM. So at, at this point, there are no there's no glaciers on Earth anywhere. Um, there's no sea ice. And the Azola event is something that sort of happened um, because of that. So in the Arctic Ocean, so the, the North Pole, essentially, there's a, a small ocean there that is mostly cut off. But it's mostly landlocked, so it's, it's almost a lake, um, not completely. And there in the summers, in, so in the austral summers, you're getting like 12 plus, you know, hours of sunlight it's fairly warm because there's no ice anywhere and uh this plant called azola starts to grow oh also because it, because it's essentially a lake you're draining lots of fresh water into this ocean and there's a lens of fresh water that sits on on top of that right and because it's cut off from the wider ocean currents it's a stratified body of water so it's not well mixed so you have layers of different types of water in this large Arctic body of water. And Azola is a, is an aquatic, basically an aquatic fern. And it, it sort of grows prodigiously, it sucks in lots of nitrogen and carbon out of the atmosphere. And it can double its biomass in very quickly, like within a day or two, if it's, if all the conditions are right. So what essentially happens is uh, this plant sort of, goes on a growth spurt there and sucks lots of carbon out of the atmosphere. And as it dies off, it sinks to the bottom of the, the Arctic, the proto Arctic ocean and into an anoxic layer. So there's no oxygen down there. So there's nothing to really consume it. So it just sits there and it doesn't really decompose 
and thus it locks up all the carbon that it just sucked out of the atmosphere up in the in the bottom of the ocean. You might also hear the term sequestered, right? That's a t- term that's commonly used for this type of locking carbon out of the carbon cycle is if you sequester it. And so this w- in this way, they were able to, it would, the earth was sort of able to, well, this played a, a, a big role in helping the earth cool down after the PETM and bringing on the um, sort of the ice ages that followed after that. And what's cool is, I mean, former guest of the show, Sora Kim, has done some work in this Arctic lake around the same time. And like there are sharks living in this weird Arctic lake with a lens of freshwater on top. And we find shark fossils like in the Arctic, which is just wild. Yeah. And and a, the reason we know that there was all this Azola living on the Arctic Ocean at that time is because of the um, International Ocean Drilling Project, the IODP. And they have a number of sites around the globe where they take these ships out and dig into the ocean sediment for meters and meters and meters. And um, when they pull up the sediment, you see this long record of everything that happens. And the the PTM is a very stark moment in these records because you see this abrupt shift in the type of sediments uh, and and microfauna that live in those sediments at that time. And then, you know, uh, right above that, a couple meters above that. So you're moving forward in time as you come closer and closer to the surface. We see a bunch of pollen from this plant. And what's interesting is, you know, Patrick kind of pointed it out that uh, this plant, which had this really intense bloom, is a freshwater plant. So there has to be some explanation for how a freshwater plant could be living on top of an ocean or a sea, essentially. And the the two explanations are either there was enough freshwater flowing in to this Arctic lake that was not being mixed so that there was this freshwater on top or in all the surrounding bodies of water that flowed into this Arctic lake, there was also a huge amount of this plant growing on that. And so the pollen was transported as the water flowed into this, into this Arctic sea basin. So it's really, I I had not heard of this event before uh, Caesar pointed it out. Had you Patrick? No, not really. But it's pretty cool. It was super interesting. And it almost seems like could be a potential like geoengineering solution for climate change today. And that well, was that's, uh, that's his next yeah. question. So Caesar so, basically knows this and we're just sort of catching the listeners up. Um, and he, he says, after a lot of fascinating clicking, I came across the website of a group called the Azola Foundation who proposed to help mitigate the effects of climate change by sequestering carbon in this way. How feasible would a, such a scheme be? And, you know, basically would this, would this work? <laughs> and there's groups that try to do this already for algal blooms they'll dump a bunch of iron in the ocean to get the get algal blooms going um i guess you could do the same thing with this that worked by the way it was totally illegal it worked and then two years later alaska had the biggest salmon catch they've ever had (laughs) i think the trick is really getting you got to sink that plant and take it out of the carbon cycle so you'd you'd have to do it in a place where when it sinks it's going to wind up in an anoxic environment um, so you need a place that's not really mixing very well, um, which, you know, you could potentially find. And, but I, I don't know. I think you're really going to have a hard time doing this on a scale, on the scale right. necessary. That's what I was going to say. I think, yeah, it works, but the magnitude of the problem and then the mathematics involved makes it, okay, well. I think you're, you, you need to take advantage. You need to use every single lake as an Azola factory. Well, I mean, we have a. We have a tr- trees do a pretty good job of sequestering carbon, and we, we you know we're just taking those out as almost as fast as as anything. I mean, you you also yeah. have to remember that the Azola event lasted longer oh, than yeah. like the entirety of human civilization, right? So we're talking about at least you know like an eight hundred thousand year period of these bloom episodes. And we don't have a place to do it. I mean, I guess you could take the Great Lakes and like the Caspian Sea or something. and Or uh, the Black Sea, which I think actually does have a pretty decent freshwater layer on top because it's not it's poorly mixed. Yeah, that was I my mean, next question. Are there are there existing seas that have that stratification? To the, the, the Black Sea was the one I read about being the most similar to what they think this Arctic Sea would have been like. Um, I mean, you know, it's also maybe once the Arctic sea ice melts again, it's possible we might yeah. start seeing... It'll and, probably you know, be better mixed than the, this yeah, this one during no, the certainly Eocene, but uh, it might happen naturally just because we're heating the earth up so much. 
Isola is pretty awesome how it can double biomass in like a day with the right conditions. So, I mean, there's something to be learned from that, like identifying super fast growing plants. Yeah. And then even better yet, if we could identify fast growing plants that can be converted to ethanol or biodiesel without much waste or energy or fertilizer inputs, then that, that would, it wouldn't reduce carbon, but it would, it could take, um, petroleum products off the market, which would limit the introduction, further introduction of carbon into the atmosphere. I guess. I mean, I, I feel like we're, you know, we mess with corn, corn as a biofuel and I'm not sure how much good that's doing us. Yeah. That was the case of like, I got a hammer. What can I do with it? Sort of thing rather than like, <laughs> being like, maybe I should find a better tool. I th- but yeah, I, I, mean, I feel like we're going to have I totally, to totally, you're totally them. right though, Patrick, like the whole food, energy, water, hate triangle is going to be a defining problem and challenge this coming century. I think we're going to have to find a mineral solution for locking carbon up. I'm not sure. I mean, we have basically waged a war I mean, on biology <laughs> that does any kind of, you know, ecosystem service for us. So I don't know how much you know, land, you know, earth surface area it's going to take to farm a a biology that's going to do this work for us. I'm not sure we're going to be able to pull it off that way. Um, I feel like it's, we're going to have to take advantage of, of making some, a mineral or maybe, you know, a, a gas or a liquid form that we can stick underground somewhere and take advantage of that third dimension because I, I don't think we, we're going to tolerate the area that's going to take for, you know, the surface area it's going to take for something like this to work. Yeah. Isn't that, it, we're such a, I mean, the downer statement, downer trigger warning. We're in a state right now where it's much easier to picture like the collapse of everything rather than a solution. Yeah. It's, it, could just become an issue of survival instead of fixing. Yeah. Well, I hope people are enjoying this podcast on their hand crank MP3 listening devices <laughs> yeah. in in the desert that was once Earth. Save some of those electrons for desalinating water, please. Yeah, as the as the sands blow the the tr- <laughs> the, the sand uh, r- removal from the wind slowly. Uh, a Trump statue emerges from. The- <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I you know from what I've what I've learned, obviously I think we would all agree there's not going to be one silver bullet that fixes global warming. So it's it's going to require uh, uh, a combined, multifaceted effort, so large and complicated and long term thinking that the politics of the way the world's work will make it likely never happen. And with the amount of carbon that we've already released into the atmosphere. Yeah. The only real drawdown that we're going to see is the silicate weathering cycle, and that's going to take thousands of years. Yeah, well, I think we're, we're we're at the point where a geoengineering solution is pretty much required, right? We can't right. just stop, emit, yeah. even it, and we're we're not going to stop. And even if we could, that wouldn't solve the problem. Stop emitting right. carbon, I mean. And so we're going to have to come up with some kind of solution to actually draw carbon out of the atmosphere, and. I don't know. I mean, we humans are pretty ingenious. Maybe we'll come up with something. I hope we do. Yeah. It'll be all right, guys. We're yeah, we're incredibly ingenious and adaptive. We're a little selfish, so other things may suffer. Well, I've been I've been thinking about the uh there's a Greek proverb that's been on my mind a lot lately and I think it's kind of an appropriate note to end on. And it's that um, society flourishes when old men plant trees whose shade they know they will never enjoy. I like that one. And so I think um, we've we've seen recently in world politics with a couple of uh, votes that went in unexpected ways that uh, maybe maybe our current society doesn't think that way. And I think it would be better if it did. And I think those are the kinds of thinking and attitudes it's going to take to start making serious changes in the way we live our lives that that help thwart the threats for future generations. Well, yeah. So go I forth mean, and throw shade. Is that right? I don't know. Yeah. What were you going to say? Right. Well, you, I, you had I, something insightful to say. I don't. I, I don't feel like the 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 vote was specifically an anti anti science anti 
um, climate change vote. I think there were, there's a lot of other things going on. And I, I certainly hope that, you know, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm not real, I'm pretty depressed about the whole thing. And I, I keep trying to look for, <laughs> trying to convince myself that, you know, things aren't, maybe aren't as bad as I think they are, but. Yeah, and I was being purposely vague because I was also kind of talking about Brexit. So I'm talking about Brexit and the most yeah. uh, recent U.S. presidential election, both of which had people above a certain age voting overwhelmingly one way and people below a certain age voting overwhelmingly the other way. And in both instances, the people, the younger folk were on the losing side of that election. So that's kind of what know, I was. The problem was with young people at. is that they get old, though. Yeah, no, that's definitely a thing that happens. I mean, globalization is a pretty thing to society and i think this is just kind of a little bit of a, a pullback or a check and it's it's i don't think it was the healthiest measure but it's certainly not a unpredictable thing that society did well i i think you know we've we've you know the world has certainly overall poverty rates have you know decreased vastly across the world but uh, yeah by a factor of a hundred over the yeah. last hundred years but, you know, I think that's something we kind of know how to – we we sort of knew how to do as a world society. We were like, oh, we can just in, – increase globalization will continue to lift developing countries out of poverty and put them on a path to being developed nations. And I think that, you know, there are some people that got left behind a little bit in developed countries and they, they got tired of seeing that. And, you know, the – the, the counter measure to that is we don't really know how, to, you know, that's a much harder thing. That's something we don't know how to do is lift people in developed nations who aren't doing that well. We, we don't really know how to fix that problem very well. We, it was yeah. much easier for us to focus on, on and, and it's a noble goal to, to lift, develop, you know, absolutely, you know, tremendous poverty. We were, we were making great strides in that worldwide, but I, you know, I think a lot of it, it, apparently in more than one country, um, the population said it's time. Well, to, a strange thing happened. Like, yeah, wealth shifted to the poorest, and that's so important that 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 needs to happen. But that shift came from the small population in the middle, rather than the population at the very, very top. Right. The yeah. Infinitesimally small population at the top. The infinitesimally small population at the top got even richer. So the poor got richer, and the richest, richy, richy pe people got richer. And, and the money the shifted middle. from uh, the the people in the middle, and the people in the middle said, "This is bullshit." Okay, last last thing I'll say is, uh, it's hard to know what to do in that situation. I don't think what what we've elected to do is going to help that situation at all. <laughs> no, not at but, all. But <laughs> um, I'm not sure what podcast this has turned into. I feel like we're on a Vox.com podcast. We decided as a country to get out of the car in the middle of the desert because we didn't like where we were going, but that, that <laughs> wasn't the smart decision either. But I think for, for us as a podcast, our attitude has always been, you know, we're a big tent. We want anybody who's curious about science to be able to come here and learn something that they didn't know before and be awed and impressed and hopefully swayed towards a more scientifically literate worldview. And we haven't talked explicitly about President-elect Trump and the things that he's going to do, in part because it's so hard to predict what he will do because he's such <laughs> a mercurial person and personality. And so I think, you know, we're not ignoring it, but we are going to have to come at it from a scientific perspective since we're not economists, we're not sociologists, uh, we're not lawyers. So we, you know, as things are announced and things progress, I think we will come to the microphone with opinions on how that will affect science. And that's going to be the perspective we continue to try to take. And odds are we will be critical. <laughs> I doubt we're going to have a lot positive to say, but we're going to try and come at it from a place that we are equipped to talk about it and, and not, you know, not talk in, in areas that we maybe don't have uh, yeah, I think, the knowledge. Yeah. Base. Mr. Rogers words like, you know, look for the helpers is is a good good platform right now so help yourself help help the area of science or whatever walk of life you are in help that out and and help mr trump too because he needs it and i think education is going to be a big part of that i mean part you know that there's been a lot of talk this 
this election cycle about the role of ignorance and the role of echo chambers. And so, you know, not that we are a perfect source of information, but if you think that we're the kind of source of information that people in your life might not be getting, share an episode, you know, try to try to get people to take a little bit more scientific perspective on things. If you think that that's something that's lacking in their current worldview. Um, I think to, to work towards closing out the show, I, I would say that, um, there's with any kind of large um, institutional change or you know, change in, in politics, there's going to be um, policies that are winners and, and losers. So if you feel like any of the, the things you appreciate in this world are in danger, you should look for um, institutions and nonprofits to support. This is the time of year when people like to give a little bit of money away. Um, so, you know, Look for for nonprofits and, and other institutions that are doing work you think is important that you think might get ignored in this regime change. And um, <laughs> if we're on your list, uh, we'll certainly accept any any donations you want to put our way, and we'll try to keep doing what we think is important. I mean, honestly, this election has galvanized me in a way of obviously I want to defend marginalized groups that might need defending uh in the day in the days to come but i also have just been thinking a lot about like how can we redouble our efforts to spread science to the people you know we do this show we have fun with it is it the most effective way to reach unreached audiences i don't know but it's something i've been thinking a lot about and so you know if people out there have ideas or suggestions or new avenues we can explore i mean this this is the time where i'm really open to thinking about things like that and and trying to figure out what I can do to help spread good science. No, I agree with that. This, this was a bit of an existential crisis for me. And so I was like, okay, I need to make the world I want. And so I'm, yeah, I'm all, all, all for, uh, participating as much as I can with science. Sort of, I just submitted a chapter on wind energy to a book and I'd been sitting on that for like a year. And as soon as the election happened, I was like, okay, nobody else was going to do this. I guess I should do it. So, um, yeah. Is it is it worth trying to say anything we're thankful for? Or are we all oh, too yeah. depressed? I'm thankful for a lot of things. I mean, life's life's pretty good. I mean, if you compare our this is supposed to be our Thanksgiving show. If you compare our lives to like the most anybody else's life in the course of all of human history, I mean, there's been about a hundred billion people that have ever lived. There's seven point five billion alive right now, and I mean. A lot of us, at least two billion of us, are living pretty great lives compared to the other ninety eight billion so there's a lot to be thankful for, and I think we're going to continue on on a macro trajectory to to more enriched longer better lived lives as as a species um, and yeah there's going to be hiccups and challenges along the road, but I think we're in general doing doing pretty good we just need to continue to to be self-reflective and aware as a species, which is something that's that's new to us because globalization yeah, it's a, is... A, it's a big ask for 7 billion individual brains to come to grips with. But I think, you know, it's a noble a noble and worthwhile goal and what, to What other to ask is there? That is the ask, right? Yeah. Patrick, are you, are you thankful for anything? I, well, like you said, there's, there's not too much point in trying to predict what's going to happen. But uh, we, have, we live in a country the three of us do anyway, that has made enormous scientific contributions and still puts a lot of money towards science, um, even if it's not all necessarily the sort of basic research the three of us think about as being, as being science. But, you know, we have institutions like NASA and the U.S. Geological Survey and NOAA and the National Science Foundation. And, I, and you know, any time that what... Sh- it seems like maybe those institutions don't get as much funding as you'd like, but they, those still, compared to the rest of the world, and like Charlie's saying, compared to all of history, there's a huge amount of money going to science, and sometimes it's easy to lose sight of that. But I'm thankful for all of those institutions and for all of that support. And uh, for me, you know, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't thank the people who support our show financially, both directly and indirectly through things like Amazon, and the fact that this year I was able to raise several thousand dollars 
from the general public to to work on my science. And like, that's really cool that we have a, a world that allows me to connect with people to share my science, to share what excites me, and they get excited back and are willing to help me out with it. And that's something I'm incredibly thankful for. That's awesome. Bit of a bit of trying to end things on a bit of a positive yeah. note. No, man, it's it's all good. It's you just you know, as scientists sometimes we're realistic and pragmatic. Well when you're when you're really thankful, I don't think of it as being it's not it's not a jo- it's not necessarily joyful, it's humbling. That's a good point. That is a good point. All right, boys. Well, anything left to say, or should we should we wrap this one up? Put a bow on it. Yeah, don't seek happiness. Seek fulfillment. <laughs> I like that. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much for listening. It's always a joy to do these episodes for for all y'all and to take. You know, it's it's kind of fun to do episodes that are just feedback because you get like all these crazy questions that you never would have thought about. Uh, otherwise are considered as a topic. So uh, we really enjoy doing it, and uh, we hope that you get a kick out of our our annual Thanksgiving episodes. And uh, if you don't, guess what? Next week, we'll be right back at you with a whole lot more science. Sort of. Visit sciencesortof.com for show notes, links to all the stories we talked about, and ways to interact with the hosts, guests, and other listeners. Science Sort Of is brought to you by the Brachialobe Media Network of Podcasts, with audio engineering by Tim Dobbs of the Encyclopedia Brunch Podcast. That's all for this week. See you next time on Science Sort Of. Be back in two shakes. Okay. Where does that phrase come from? What were they shaking? Yeah, I don't know. A martini? Or Probably. Ass? That wouldn't make sense. So, Charlie, apparently the original idiom is in two shakes of a lamb's tail. I believe that's right. I didn't know that, though. So, something to do with the friskiness of lambs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the fact that their tails got chopped off, which increases the... The yeah. shake rate? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which sounds Re- like shake frequency. Weight. You know, pendulum frequency rates, yeah. function yeah. of length. This week's episode of Science Order brought to you by the shake weight. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> Get some of that shake weight money. Yeah. <laughs>